So in the first part, I introduce you to the urban legend and purported time traveler, John Teeter. And we talked about a little bit about the fundamental possibility of the time travel that he proposed, which is interdimensional kind of jumping, and that being possible through the advent of quantum computing. In part two, we talked a little bit about some of his darker predictions for America and how unless you were one of the 133 million that died, tragically, for the survivors picking up the pieces, life wasn't so bad. Or at least not as bad as the typical Hollywood uh, movie post-apocalyptic kind of scenario plays out. So today, in part three, we want to take a look at what the Bible has to say about the future of America and what some contemporary prophets, and some that are not so contemporary, had to prophesy about the future of America. Today on Simply Stated. <laughs> Okay, everybody, welcome back to Simply Stated. Let's again, let's jump right into this. So today, we're going to take a look at how the Bible kind of lends credence to what John Teeter was maybe saying, if John Teeter was, in fact, a real person. So right away, let's take a look at some contemporary prophecies before we get into what the Bible actually has to say. And so we're going to, we're going to start with some of the older ones first. And so we're going to go all the way back to George Washington. The founder of our nation had a, had a, a, a series of visions in which an angel came to him, and this is all you can. This is in the the Library of Congress, so this isn't top secret stuff. You can you can view it and research it online if you want to. And so this angel came to him, and gave him a vision of the three times that there would be war on American soil. And in the first vision, it was the Revolutionary War, so America's fighting for its independence against Britain. The second one was the Civil War, and the third one is a war that's to come in the future. And so I'm going to share with you that one right now. Then my eyes beheld a fearful scene. From each of these continents arose thick black clouds that were soon joined into one. And throughout the mass there gleamed a dark red light by which I saw hordes of armed men. These men, moving with the cloud, marched by land and sailed by sea to America, which country was enveloped in the volume of the cloud. And as I dimly saw these vast armies devastate the whole country and the villages and towns and cities which I had seen springing up, as my ears listened to the thundering of cannons and the clashing of swords and the shouts and cries of millions in mortal combat, I again heard the mysterious voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. Where the voice had ceased, the dark shadow angel placed its trumpet to its mouth and blew a long and fearful blast. Instantly, a light as of a thousand suns shone down from above me, and pierced and broke into the fragments of the dark cloud which enveloped America. At the same moment, the angel upon whose head still shone the word Union, and who bore the national flag in one hand and a sword in the other, descended from the heavens attended by legions of white spirits. These immediately joined the inhabitants of America, who I perceived to be well nigh overcome, but who immediately, taking courage again, closed up their broken ranks and renewed the battle. Again, amid the fearful noise of the conflict, I heard the mysterious voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. As the voice ceased, the shadowy angel for the last time dipped water from the ocean and sprinkled it upon America. Instantly, the dark cloud rolled back, together with the armies it had brought, leaving the inhabitants of the land victorious. Then once more, I beheld the villages and the towns and cities springing up where I had seen them before. While the bright angel planted the azure standard he had brought in the midst of them, cried with a loud voice, While the stars remain and the heavens send down dew upon the earth, so long shall the union last. And taking from his brow the crown on which blazoned the word union, he placed it upon the standard while the people kneeling down said amen. So we can see from George Washington's uh, vision that according to him, America is attacked and almost destroyed completely, except for divine intervention. And one of the things I want to note there is that the armies came by land and by sea because I, I think you're going to find that's kind of a common theme in a lot of these prophecies and uh, also in what the Bible has to say. So the next prophet I want to bring to you is a Romanian gentleman named Dimitri Dudeman. And he kind of uh, came to America in the, in the early 80s, mid 80s, um, directed by the Lord. He did not want to be here, kind of dragged his feet. He was very upset about being here. and. Uh, the Lord sent him here specifically to warn America and, and gave Dimitru several signs to prove 
to Dimitru that, you know, it was in fact the work of the Lord. And, and they, I don't want to get into all the details because it's going to take too long, but they all played out. Dimitru, has, who has since passed on, went around and kind of warned America of what's coming. Now this takes place in 1984, I believe, is when he first introduced this message, or began to introduce this message. Now I want to, I want to interject and say something here about prophecy in general. And a lot of people will dismiss the George Washingtons and the Dimitri Dudemans and, and some of the other prophets I'm going to bring up, you know, because they prophesied 20, 30, in George Washington's case, <clears throat> 250 years ago. And because it didn't happen, because it didn't come to pass in a matter of days, months, or short years, they just kind of write it off as, yeah, he's, you know, he's a false prophet. It's not, it's not coming true. But I want to point out that the biblical prophets prophesied for years. In fact, Isaiah prophesied the captivity of Judah 95 years before it actually occurred. That's almost a century. And so it's real easy with that kind of time frame for people just to kind of go, yeah, it's, you know, he's just talking, it's not gonna happen, you know, he didn't hear from the Lord or whatever. But one of the things I, I really want you to get a hold of is the Lord is not anxious to see people destroyed. That's not his will, it's not his heart. He's looking for every reason to hold back the judgment. In fact, it's really not him eager to bring judgment, it's Satan eager to see God have to bring judgment. The name Satan means the, the accuser, and he stand, the Bible says he stands before and accuses the brethren day and night. And if you look at it from a legal sense, and if you can imagine a courtroom, an actual legal setting, that's what's really going on, is Satan is prosecuting the saints and bringing up, and, and not only saints, but towns and, and nation and organization and everything. He just bringing accusations against it. And if there's nobody to defend or not sufficient defense, because the Lord is good and righteous and judges, he has to pass a judgment. And sometimes it breaks his heart to do so, kind of like a judge whose own son ran afoul of the law. He doesn't necessarily want to see him punished and go to jail, but because he's a judge, he has to make the right decision. And so, and that's kind of where this is at. The, the Lord has a heart of mercy, but Satan is bringing accusations and accusations, and it's the Lord's will to postpone though and to give every chance for repentance and to turn around. And like in the case of Jonah, you know, the Lord said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy Nineveh, and I want you to preach repentance. Well, Jonah didn't want Nineveh to repent. He didn't like the Assyrians. They were terrible people, and he was happy that they were going to be judged, and so he tried to run. But God said, look, this is a huge city with lots of people. It's not insignificant, and I do not want them destroyed. So you're going to go in there, and you're going to preach repentance. And hopefully, they'll hear, they'll listen, and they'll turn. And they did, for a period. But about 138 years later, they did, in fact, fall. Nineveh was destroyed uh, by the Babylonians, I believe, or a coalition with the Babylonians in charge. So God's heart is, is mercy. He wants to postpone this stuff. He is not eager to see people destroyed or nations destroyed. So back to Dimitri. One of the interesting things about Dimitri's vision or the message that the Lord, let's say that, the message that the Lord gave Dimitri to preach was how much detail there was in it. Um, and keep in mind, this was back at the heart of the Cold War, 1984. America and Russia were at loggerheads, you know. It was the height of the Cold War. So this this vision of Dimitrius begins, basically he's just arrived in America, he's kicking some rocks outside of his, his new apartment because he's upset about being here. He doesn't speak the language, he knows nobody, he's got nothing, doesn't even have a bed. And while he's out there, an angel comes to him and kind of takes him for a ride. And, and according to him, it wasn't even a vision. He said, I was totally awake and he showed me. And so this is what Dimitrius saw. And Dimitri said, he showed me all of California and said, This is Sodom and Gomorrah. All of this in one day will burn. It is, its sin has reached the Holy One. Then he took me to Las Vegas. This is Sodom and Gomorrah. In one day it will burn. Then he showed me the state of New York. Do you know what this is? He asked me. I said, no. He said, this is New York. It is Sodom and Gomorrah. In one day it will burn. Then he showed me all of Florida. This is Florida, he said. This is Sodom and Gomorrah. And in one day it will burn. And one of the things I, I wanted to bring to your attention again is the suddenness of the destruction, according to Dimitri of America, in one day, in one day this happened. So going back to the vision, the angel said, remember this, Dimitri, the Russian spies have discovered where the nuclear warehouses are in America. When the Americans will think that it is in peace and safety, from the middle of the country, some people will start fighting against the government. The government will be busy with internal problems. Then, 
From the ocean, from Cuba, Nicaragua, and Mexico, he also told me two other countries, but I did not remember what they were. They will bomb the nuclear warehouses. When they explode, America will burn. What will you do with the church? I asked. How will you save the ones who will turn towards you? He said, tell them this, how I saved the three young ones from the furnace of fire, and how I saved Daniel from the lion's den. In the same way, I will save them. So one of the things I want to take away from Dimitrius again, is the suddenness of destruction. The fact that it's not just Russia alone attacking America, it's a coalition of nations. And he, meant, he mentioned Mexico, uh, Nicaragua, Cuba, and there were other South American countries. He couldn't recall them in the vision. But if you, if you look at the news today, you can see the polarization of Latin America against America right now. I mean, we are not winning friends and win influencing people, to be sure. The third thing I wanted to bring up from Demetrius is that aspect about there's going to be infighting in America. From the middle of the country, there's going to be uh, fighting against the government, which I think, if you remember part two, ties right in with what John Teeter said. Basically, a civil war in America. Maybe not on the scale that the first civil war was, but definitely there's going to be fighting back and forth that will draw the government's attention away from its external enemies to happen to deal with the insurrection in its very midst. So moving a couple years forward, this next vision or prophecy, however you want to look at it, comes from a gentleman named Henry Groover, a uh, well-known pastor. He's kind of famous for prayer walking, doing spiritual warfare in cities around the world and stuff like that. In fact, he was in England at the time when the Lord gave him this vision. So let's take a look at that. Henry Groover had a vision around 1986 of the invasion of America and its total destruction at the hands of Russians and the Chinese. He saw Russians moving by sea and air from the north to destroy America by nerve gas and nuclear weapons. The Russians will steal materials and will spoil the United States after the destruction. The death toll of America will reach over 120 million people or 60% of the population. He was looking down on the earth like a map when he saw the massive military movement from Russia coming down from the Icelandic waters from the north. The Russian army came down across the Atlantic Ocean to attack America by sea. The major destruction started in the cities of New York, Seattle, Washington, Miami, Florida, San Diego, and Los Angeles, California. The sign of this vision and its time of the destruction of America at the hands of Russian invasions is this, quote, when Russia opens her gates and lets the masses go to the free world, the world will occupy themselves with transporting housing and caring for the masses and will begin to let their weapons down and will cry peace and safety. And that's when it will happen. So again, I want to point out that like Dimitrius, Henry's vision came right at the height of the Cold War. And so that little qualifier about the timing, Russia opening the doors and letting their masses out, during the Cold War, they kind of had closed gate, gate policy. It wasn't easy for Russian citizens to leave the country. We know that you know it's an open democracy now. Russians can come and go. There's a large Russian population here in Sacramento. I think that uh, much like the Bible and people misinterpret sections of that, possibly the masses that they're talking about may possibly be the Syrian refugees that are now flooding the countries of the world and people are struggling to find places for these people honestly it's not working out well for the countries that have taken in large amounts of these refugees and so it's it's possible and I'm just throwing this out as a possibility not saying I'm dogmatic on this but it's possible that the whole refugee scenario has been contrived and manipulated by somebody to destabilize country just something to think about I also want to point out and I don't have any uh, script to read you of it but I have research lots of Henry's visions and further on in this vision he makes the note that in the midst of the attack God will call people in fact Dimitri does the same thing God told Dimitri the same thing there will be red points of refuge for the American citizens during the attack they will have to listen for God but he will tell them hey you need to go here you need to go to this place that place there's gonna be more than one but specifically Henry saw one group and I don't recall where they were at I don't even know if he mentioned where they were at but there was a group of people living in this this like safety zone if you will while basically the coasts are being attacked they weren't secret the enemies knew where they were at and sent a missile a cruise missile to attack that little spot and God said watch what I do and he caused a, a volcanic eruption and the smoke clogged the missile and the missile just boop, doom, boop, doom, fell to the ground because if they're not detonated they don't do anything it's not like uh, they just explode on impact so it dismantled the propulsion system of this missile and just fell to the ground so 
when we were looking at Demetrius, God said he will protect the church just like he protected Daniel and Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And in Henry's vision, he actually gave an example of one of the things that those people would see. So I found that interesting. Because one of the underlying things I want to get across to people is, though this seems like very dark and dire news, if you're trusting God, it's just a thing. He will see you through it. He'll protect you through it. So moving on. Now let's take a look at what the Bible has to say about America. And for most people, you're probably going, oh, America's not mentioned in the Bible. And I would say you're wrong. However, it's not mentioned as America by the name America. It is mentioned. We're one of the greatest nations in the history of mankind. It just makes sense that we would be mentioned in the Bible somewhere. So many other nations are mentioned in there. Why wouldn't one of the largest, wealthiest, primest piece of real estate on the planet, <laughs> the choicest piece, as Abraham Lincoln once stated, it's surely got to make mention in the Bible. And it does, and not in a good way. So let's take a look at that. So it's my contention that in the, in the Bible, when it's talking about Babylon, it's referring to not only ancient Babylon, but America in the future. And let's take a look at the fulfillment of some of these prophecies. And so the scriptures that you can go to, to to read these are Jeremiah 50 and 51 and Isaiah 47 and then Revelation 17 and 18. And so a lot of people are going to contend that that prophecy fulfill, was fulfilled when Babylon was overthrown by the, by the, the Medes and the Persians. And I'm going to say, no, that is not the case. Because as you read, one of the key, there's a couple key features about most of the description of the destruction of Babylon. And one is how sudden it happened overnight. And in ancient Babylon, it did happen that way. The Medes and the Persians diverted uh, one of the major rivers, I can't remember if it's, uh, I want to say it's the Tigris, but it could be the Euphrates. Uh, forgive me for this lapse in geographical remembrance. But they basically diverted the river that one of the gates of the city were built on, and and they were able to march right under that gate. With, with the river not there, they were able to march right under it. And it happened in the middle of the night, and there was a festival going on, one of their religious festivals at the time. And so the next day, most of the city was not even aware that they had been taken over. So it wasn't this bloody military conquest where, they, where, you know, Genghis Khan style, where they piled a pyramid of skulls at the gate of the city to prove a point. Nope, nope, nope. They just, they went in and calmly took over. It was more of an administration change. Like, that old guy's out, the new guy's in. Guess what? Everybody just continue what you're doing. Be awesome. Thank you. And that's pretty much how it went. In fact, the Medes and the Persians had a greater tolerance for religious diversity, which the Babylonians loved, uh, because the previous Babylonian ruler uh, was not very fond of the god Marduk, which was one of their favorites, and the Medes and the Persians let them carry on with worshiping Marduk. Uh, part of that worshiping was sacrificing babies and, and children to him. And so he just offered religious freedom. So the new rulers of the city were kind of received warm, a warm welcome. In fact, Babylon never was really destroyed. Even at the time of Christ, Babylon was a thriving, viable city. There were more Jews in Babylon than there were in Palestine in Jesus' time. So it was still going on that well. And I bring that up to make the point that that's one of the other key features in a lot of the prophecy regarding Babylon is not only its sudden destruction, but it's total destruction. God makes the point of bringing up that it will not be inhabited. It'll be a des desolate wasteland. Jackals and hyenas will inhabit it, you know, that whole bit. You're not going to go there. There won't be anybody living there. It'll be desolate and deserted. Ancient Babylon is that way now, you know, thousands of years later. But that's thanks to the U.S. military storing depleted uranium munitions on what was the historical site of Babylon. So right now it's radioactive. So even if they wanted to rebuild it, you can't because it's radioactive. So let's take a look at some of the key aspects or some of the things that describe Mystery Babylon and see if you don't agree that they fit the description of America currently today. Future Babylon is a land of many waters. A broad river in its middle is divided by rivers. And you'll read that in Jeremiah 51.13. Uh, 
Uh, future Babylon is a land of immigrants. Future Babylon has no fear of invasion on its home soil. Future Babylon has carried over and incorporated many aspects of old Babylon religion. Future Babylon is noted for the disrespect of the elderly. Future Babylon is a military power, land and air travel. It would seem to have a massive air power capability in the military. Future Babylon is noted for its sensual, materialistic, and hedonistic lifestyle. Future Babylon is noted for its statues, its love of graphic pictures, and perhaps its media. Future Babylon is noted for its cultural insanity. Future Babylon is noted for its elegant, luxurious, refined, rich lifestyles used as amorous, alluring gestures of an enticing woman. Future Babylon is noted for drugs and drug use. Future Babylon is noted for the occultic and occult practices, from astrology to witchcraft and alliance to evil forces. Future Babylon is noted for a high standard of living. Future Babylon is noted for being highly and overly optimistic about about its future. Future Babylon in its past knew God and divine truth, but departed away from God and his truth. Future Babylon is noted as a land of rebels, as not only in its birth, but now also in its judgment for rebellion against God. Future Babylon is a cosmopolitan and urban nation. Future Babylon is a key commercial nation to the world and has been so since its becoming a nation. Future Babylon is considered to be allied to the rebel forces of Satan and his armies and powers. Future Babylon is called in the prophecies the Queen of Kingdom. Future Babylon is referred to as a golden cup in God's hands. So I encourage everybody to look at those, those scriptures, Jeremiah uh, 50, 51, Isaiah 47. Read those. I'm going to read Revelation 18 for you right now. I just The other ones are so long and take forever. So knowing that ancient Babylon was not destroyed, it was taken over in an instant, but it went on for years and years and years. So none of the prophecies of Babylon were fulfilled in ancient Babylon. And so, but I think all the descriptive terms for mystery Babylon fit America. And I think that's where we're headed. And so let me read Revelation 18. See again if this doesn't sound just like America. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. For all the nations have drunk of her maddening wine of adultery. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins have piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crime. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as a queen. I am not a widow, and I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. And when the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her, terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe, O great city, O Babylon, city of power. In one hour your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linens, purples, silks, scarlet, and every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory and costly wood bronze, iron, and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh, and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle, sheep, and horses, and carriages, and the bodies and souls of men. And then they will say, the fruit you long for is gone from you. All of your riches and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe, O oh great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ships, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, Was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads with weeping and mourning and cry out, Woe, Woe, O great city, 
where all who had ships of the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. Rejoice over her, O heavens. Rejoice, saints and apostles and prophets. God has judged her for the way she treated you. Then the mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, With such violence the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. The music of harpists and musicians, flute players and trumpets will never be heard in you again. No workman of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of a bridegroom and a bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's great men. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. In her were found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and all who have been killed on the earth. So to this date, I think you would agree, there is no nation that fits that description like America. And so I gotta, I gotta reiterate once again, I'm not bringing this up to cause panic, to cause dread, but to cause hope because wars come, wars are gonna happen. Right now in this time frame, there's wars going on this very minute. There's people suffering and dying in wars just not in this country. And there's a history in the Bible of ancient Israel. And they will, God will bless them, they'll do good, they're loving God, and because of the ease of life and success they have, they tend to fall away from God. And to correct that, he brings in another nation to subject them. And then they spend some time not digging life, being subjected, sometimes as slaves, uh, and they cry out to the God, and he hears them and he delivers them, and he brings them back up. and. They're on top again, and they're doing good, and they forget God, and they fall again. And he brings in another nation to subject them. And it's a cycle that's repeated over and over again. And I think America has reached the, the apex of that cycle for us. Uh, a once godly nation now has forgotten God and turned its back and, and rejected God. And we see that in our culture plain as day. No question, I think everybody could agree. And that's just how God deals with nations. A couple things I want to point out about that prophecy is gleaning information from what John Teeter said, what Henry Gruber said, what Dimitri said. There will be survivors. I know when you read that Revelation passage, it makes it sound like the entire United States is just going to be one vast desert, and I don't think that's going to be the case. There's going to be cities that are vast wastelands and for a long time uninhabitable. But this is a big country and there's still gonna be lots of land in the middle that are completely habitable and people will live and life will go on and people will pick up the pieces. We may not always be called Americans, maybe we will. We'll pick up the pieces, we'll move on. Demographically, we may look different. We, there may be far more Latinos in here, there'll be Russians and Chinese make up a greater population of, of our country, but I, I believe America will continue on and I think will like John Teeter said, will be closer to God and just a more connected people. So if there's, if you can draw any solace from that, I hope you can. I know it, it helps me to think about future terrible events, knowing that people will survive. That concludes this series. I am ready to get on to some other stuff. I hope it blessed you. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Uh, once again, it would be a huge favor if, if you would subscribe. Appreciate that, a personal favor. And I will see you on the next installment. Be blessed.